Welcome to our online worship service for this Sunday in the church year. I think we're in the third Sunday of Lent, uh, and we uh, welcome you wherever you are and however you're able to uh, watch us and participate. Uh, even though we are separate, we are the church gathered, and we welcome you to this time. Uh, in terms of announcements, uh, just to say we're going to be probably doing online worship for uh, the next several Sundays. We are so uh, hopeful for the news that we're hearing of, of vaccines. More and more people in the congregation are able to get vaccines, and we're thankful for that. And we, uh, we really anticipate um, a hopeful summer. Uh, but for right now, uh, as we go through uh, uh, the Easter season, just to let you know that we will be having an online Monday Thursday worship service, so uh, look forward to that. We're hoping, if the weather permits uh, at all possible, to have uh, we're going to have an online Easter worship service, but also have a uh, an outside in-person service, something like we did for World Communion Sunday. Uh, perhaps here in the parking lot or in some part of the, the church grounds that we can gather safely, socially distance, and uh, obeying all the protocols, but uh, something uh, for Easter Sunday in particular that we are planning. Uh, so I think that's uh, all the announcements for now. So again, welcome you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us worship God.
Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled against him. Let us then renounce our willfulness and seek his mercy by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Brothers and sisters, when deeds of inequity overwhelm us, God forgives our transgressions. Be at peace, for God restores and strengthens you and waters your soul in its parched and inaccessible places. Friends, believe in the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of your Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses God's name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but resteth the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello and welcome to Time with the Children. Can you say hi? Hi. Hi. Jackie, say hi. 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 We are out in our front yard today. It's a sunny day. It's a little bit breezy, but it is beautiful outside. And Lila is watering our flowers. They're, they're weeds, but she thinks they're flowers, so we'll go with it. She's spraying them with a water gun. We are just enjoying some time outside today, and I thought it'd be a good time to talk to you. Um, as a lot of you might know, we are so excited about having an outdoor Easter worship service. We are so, so excited. I have missed you guys so much and I cannot wait to see you. Um, and with that, it brings a lot of hope. So right now we're in Lent and Lent can be a little bit of a sadder, more solemn time, but it all builds up to the hope of Easter. Easter brings so much hope. So I thought for the next few weeks, I could um, show you guys a sign of hope that I've been seeing out in the world. And then when we get back together for Easter, it'll be the biggest, most joyful, hopeful day of all. So the first thing I saw was flowers, which one of my children is stomping and one is watering. So we come out kind of even. But Lila, can you come here? Why do you like flowers? Are flowers beautiful? Who made flowers? Jesus, that was unprompted. Um, okay, so today our hope is warm weather, the hope of being back together in a few I weeks, like and flowers. flowers, which anything can be a flower if you hope hard enough. So, all right, Lila, you come say a prayer with me? All right, you ready? Close your eyes. Dear God, thank you for the gift of hope during hard times. Let us find little glimpses of you every day. Amen. Amen. Bye. 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 You push the this is a reading from the first Corinthians, beginning in verse 1. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And our gospel reading is from the second chapter of the Gospel of John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. 
He also poured out the coins of the money changers. No one turned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It would be interesting to look back over this past year, and I'm sure people have done this, and make a list of 10 things that we've learned through all of this. Uh, both good and some not so good, you know. Who knows what it might be. We've learned to, it's not a bad thing to slow down our lives a little bit. Uh, we've learned, uh, if we didn't know, that we need each other. I mean, Aristotle said centuries ago, you know, the human being is a social animal. And we, we just, we don't do good in isolation. Uh, people need people. We've learned that the church exists outside the building. Uh, and that's been a good thing. Uh, we've, we've learned we need to be better prepared about these things in our community and in our nation, uh, and so forth and so on. I mean, I'm sure we could draw up a list of uh, 10 things, and at some point we might even codify that list and uh, use it for people years from now who are going through something similar, you know, to look back at that and uh, learn from those lessons. The point of that is that that's kind of how I've come to view the Ten Commandments that, uh, and I think part of our reading today, Grady read, they could be seen as, as irrelevant in the modern world or, you know, as this very restrictive kind of uh, legalism. But to me, it's like <clears throat> what we've learned through trial and error uh, for this people if you want your communities to flourish, if you want individuals to, to prosper, then, then just don't take, <laughs> the, don't take stuff from each other. Just don't steal. Nothing good comes from that, whether it's corporate greed or stealing somebody's sheep. Uh, and even some of the things which seem archaic to us, you know, thou shalt not make unto thyself a graven image. Don't make an idol. Uh, there are so many things that we put in the place of God. As, as, as Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, whatever your heart clings to, that's your God. Money or power or status. Uh, and again, I think for the people, it's like these are lessons that we have learned, and hopefully it will guide God's people in the future. And when I think of the peoples of that era, as I've said before, the Amorites, the Edomites, and of all these peoples, <clears throat> the Israelites survived. So it would, it might behoove us to heed, to heed these lessons. It, it's hard to talk about the Ten Commandments because you know which one do you talk about, or <laughs> you could do a whole series on, on all ten of them. But they speak to me as a whole because they are reflective of God's love. And I know the most cynical among us might say, well, you know, did God really carve these out in stone or these, uh, did these originate with the people themselves? They grew out of a faith community that believed that the God of the universe cared in love for them and, and, and loved humanity and wanted the human community, wanted human beings to flourish. Because these lessons, all ten of them, they teach, they teach people to live in ways that affirm and respect the dignity and humanity of, of every single person. And they remind us that how we think of God, what we think of God, who we think God is, affects what we do to our neighbor, how we live with those around us. 
which is probably why Jesus said, if you could just love God and love your neighbors yourself, you wouldn't have to worry about if you're breaking or following each individual commandment. Uh, it is ironic then, sadly ironic, that these lessons are often used to judge or to exclude others. And when that happens in any religion, when it excludes rather than embraces, then it loses touch with its central purpose. And I think that's why Jesus is so upset in what some of us call His temple tantrum. Uh, when in John's Gospel, Jesus goes into the temple and turns over the tables of the money changers and drives people out. This is my Father's house. You've made it a place of business. <clears throat> the outer edges of the temple probably at that time resembled something like an outdoor flea market. Uh, there were money changers. There were certain kinds of coins that you could use in the temple. And if you come from a different area, you'd have to exchange uh, for that, and probably they gouged you a little bit. Uh, there are small animals that were sacrificed, and if you didn't have one, you could buy one while you were there. Uh, certainly, you could get various kinds of religious artifacts, uh, and you come a long way, you're hungry, so there were probably shops where you could get, you know, bread or something to eat. But we think Jesus is upset <clears throat> that there's this business going on, you know, the the temple has been commercialized. I haven't been in a single church, including this one, that hasn't had some variation of this discussion at some point. And it's like, is it okay to sell Girl Scout cookies during fellowship time? Would that <laughs> violate what Jesus is talking about here? The temple was to be a house of worship for all peoples. And so Isaiah Prophet Isaiah, God's temple, all nations shall come to God's temple. And the temple had, the Cliff Notes version, had sort of three central parts. It, the, the, the inner part was the Holy of Holies, where the scrolls were kept. Only the priests were allowed into the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> outside of that were for Jewish worship, worshipers. And outside of that was an area for non-Jewish people, for Gentiles, for whomever. And it is that area that had become filled with, it become a kind of marketplace. So Jesus' anger there is not at business per se, it's that literally people can't come in to worship. So what are you doing here if it's not being a place where people can come and worship? So you're excluding others. So it's not that he's attacking Judaism or organized religion. It's religion that has forgotten its purpose. Using religion to exclude rather than to embrace and to be a place of welcome. Religion, and certainly in the Judeo-Christian tradition, is to draw people into God's love, to draw people into the divine presence, not to, not to use religion to push them away from it. There should always be room for the other. And the other, even with air quotes. And that's what John's Gospel is concerned about, in particular, is, is, is the divine presence and where we see it or see it and experience and feel it. He's not concerned about that particular practice, uh, which I bet, by the way, continued right after Jesus left. You know, we have this image that he came in, he threw out the money changers and turned over tables, and it's like, oh, that's it. They didn't do that anymore. I bet as soon as he was out of sight, they were like, who was that guy? Boy, he thinks he's God or something, doesn't he? All right, let's pick these tables up. And they went right back to doing business. You know they did. John's concerned with what that meant. The temple was the place of God's presence. That's where God is present. But this gospel was written at a time when the temple had been destroyed and early Christians and the Jewish people were, were struggling with where is God present among us? And how do we see that? How do we experience that? What do we hold on to in this crazy world where it seems like everything that we love, everything we are, is always passing away? And so John is saying that temple has been <laughs> destroyed, but God is present in this man Jesus. 
specifically that he embodies God's presence. Now we can understand that to mean that in a very exclusive way that he embodies God's presence and no one and no other place and no other religion and certainly not you Jewish people. Or we can understand that as I believe to be more to more biblical, more reflective of our own, the best of our tradition is to say that God was present in His life, in His teachings. God was present in His compassion. God was present in His passion for the kingdom of God, this, this ultimate triumph of peace and justice in the world, that God was present in Jesus' heart for the suffering and the hurting and the vulnerable that Jesus embodied a way of life that's reflective of a God, as He says, who so loved the world that He gave of God's self. There's a wonderful quote by um, Fred Rogers, which, well, I'm just going to read it because it's just, it's just very powerful and it sums up <laughs> sort of I had a discussion with someone the other day about how, uh, how do you understand God and what is God and who is God. And I thought, boy, if I'd have had this available then. But this, this is Fred Rogers. He said, I believe that at the center of the universe there dwells a loving spirit who longs for all that's best in all of creation, a spirit who knows the great potential of each planet as well as each person. And little by little, will love us into being more than we ever dreamed possible. That love spirit would rather die than give up on any one of us. That love spirit embodied in this man Jesus. And I think religion and Christianity loses, gets away from its purpose when it makes talk of Jesus a, a doctrine about the man rather than the loving spirit that this man embodied. And I think for the Gospel of John, whoever put this Gospel together felt that if we continually stay open to that loving spirit, that, that that's eternal life, that, that loving spirit. And I think, by the way, that's why the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians and the other passage that, that Grady read, you know, he's writing to a church that's trying to find its way, a church that's struggling with all kinds of things. They're fighting among themselves. They're divided over these different issues. They're struggling with the things people struggle with. They've got marriages in trouble. They've, they've suffered loss. They're going through illnesses. They have precarious jobs, struggling to hold on to faith. Some probably struggling to find faith somewhere. And, and, and Paul says, we've got to start by going back to what he calls the message about the cross. That Christ's death on the cross revealed a love so deep, so profound, so inclusive and all-embracing. And yes, he says, it'll be seen as foolishness by the Greeks. You know, the very idea that God became a human being and that you could somehow kill God, it seems foolishness. And yes, he says, it will seem like an obstacle in the Jewish tradition because the Messiah was supposed to be victorious. And how could you look at the cross and say Christ was victorious? You know? But Paul says, because it revealed a love so deep that it envelops all the world's hate and all the world's fear, that that's what redemptive love does. The power of redemptive love. And that love was there in those ten life lessons. That love was revealed in the life of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul challenges the Corinthians, and I think us, to, to live out that all-embracing, all-embracing, all-inclusive love. To, to hold on to that because Ultimately, that holds, holds on to all of us. Hallelujah and Amen. We have a message of hope for a fearful time. In our era of globalization, we offer a vision of a society that shares more and consumes less, seeks compassion over suspicion and equality over domination, and finds security in joined hands rather than mass arms. We honor the dignity of every person.
Welcome to this online time of uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, we welcome you, uh, however you might be watching this, wherever you are, and hope you have uh, elements available to uh, celebrate with us. This is the Lord's table. It's not Westminster's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table. And our Lord invites all of us to participate in this holy sharing together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God. For the word of your cross, though appearing foolish, is the power and wisdom which saves us. You created the universe, the skies tell of your glory, and the earth bears witness to your steadfast love. You brought your people from slavery to freedom. You gave your holy commandments through Moses, words that guide the simple and sharpen vision of all, reviving the soul, delighting the heart. When the world in its sophistication and pride made an idol of money and a marketplace of your temple, using your name only to boost profits, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, filled with zeal for your honor, he was torn down by the fury of evil and corruption and arose again in three days, forever establishing the foolishness and weakness of God as the pathway of life and salvation. We pray for those particular people for whom we have special concern this day. We silently name them before you, loving God. Whatever their need or personal crisis, whatever their age, health, sins, faults, or virtues, we ask you to guide, guard, nurture, sustain them. Help us to find ways to offer comfort to the afflicted, befriend the lonely, and restore hope to the hopeless. Use this holy bread and cup to sustain your church and your quest to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. On the night of his arrest, while they were at table, Jesus took the bread and tore it and said, This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, he took a cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed with my blood. As often as you drink of it, do it also in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and partake of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament, you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience, that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. And now let us pray the prayer the church has prayed for the ages. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>